let's turn our hearts and minds to our service and what we will do here today. No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, no matter where you've been, you are welcome here. And whenever we worship in this place, we acknowledge we are standing on the traditional and unceded territory of the Seo Okanagan people. No, I think see yeah. down there. You're right. The land and its resources for the people who have lived here and their teachings. If you have a candle at home, let us light our candles together. This candle dances with the presence of the spirit, reminding us of the warmth of the community which shines across our spaces this day. And invite us to take a moment to center ourselves, to breathe in, breathe out, repeat, get comfortable. And let's have some prayer and reflection as we begin. Let's pray. God of love, surround us this morning with the memory of those who have gone before us. With our thanksgiving, we remember lives well lived and loved the ways our paths intersected and created what we have today. May we be cognizant that our work carries forward, inspired, inspired by those we share this life with and those who witness surrounds us. We pray in all the names of our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is from Voices United. In the ball, there is a flower. Jane Matkin to unmute her microphone and share in our scripture reading for today. Jane. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. The Bible reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. This morning we hear familiar phrases known as the Beatitudes, a sort of recipe for living that Jesus shared with his community. On this All Saints Sunday, as we commemorate lives well lived and well loved, how does our sorrow and grief turn to joy and blessing for our community? This is from chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them the Beatitudes. 
Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Thank you. Now I'm going to invite Jim Taylor to unmute his microphone. Jim and I were talking about poetry this past week, and he shared with me a recent piece that he's been working on. So I'm going to, I thought it spoke uh, to our theme for today, but I'm going to let Jim uh, himself uh, do the introducing and then share it enough with us his piece. Jim. I uh, I should say, first of all, that, that I started this last Friday when um, when the snow was coming down in large quantities, and uh, then it has grown since then. So, Rena, if you can get the slides up. Snow falls softly on cedars. Fat white flakes sift down, pile up, branches bend, protest and pain. White cones burden bunched berries and autumn grass falls flat below an ermine cloak. Drifting, drifting flakes draw a veil across distance. Night falls softly on cedars, on snow. Fat flakes of darkness suck in the fading light. A black pall sung, slung over a silent land. Sounds soak into snow's duvet. Lights down the road blink, wink out, leave no one, nothing. Warmth spreads softly from the fire. Butter bright tongues of flame tell tales of generations circled close around the ember glow, soaking up the comfort of the pool of holiness that drives away the dark and cold. Thank you, Jim. The Beatitudes from Matthew's Gospel, as we heard Jane read this morning, are one of those overly familiar passages. We know these lines by heart, maybe, but certainly not surprised when we hear Jesus say them. Imagine his first listener so long ago in their reaction. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the mourners, the persecuted, for great things will come to them. Comfort, justice, and righteousness. Jesus' list of circumstances are not what his listeners that they were expecting to hear. Those who experience grief, depression, and persecution will be noticed in their suffering temporary. Their comfort, peace, and vindication will be theirs. Radical statements, for sure. But this is not some pie-in-the-sky promise Jesus presents to them. The beatitude are the circumstances of life. They are an act of reality. As my friend described her impression of these words from Jesus, they are like gravity, she told me. One turn leads to another, sadness to happiness. It's just the way it works. Life is not immune from suffering, setbacks, disappointments. Jesus isn't setting his listeners up for the perfect life, but rather a beatitude life. 
When we have knowledge and understanding of this, we become the stuff of saints to make a difference in our world. There are no platitudes offered here, but rather promise that our suffering is but temporary. What side of the Beatitudes do we find ourselves on? Are we feeling mournful, diminished, overlooked? Or are we the ones who are offering comfort and compassion, fighting for justice for those with no, no voice and filling the hungry with good things? I heard the Beatitudes spoken in the book, Me and White Supremacy, which our study group completed this week. I recognize from this work that a white person with a as a white person with immense privilege and power over others, that I have ongoing work to do to address my white silence when I have failed to speak up in defense of a person of color. There's also a big work to be done in my conversation with other white people. And we also learned of the police shooting that again of Walter Wallace Jr. in Philadelphia. The terrorist attack on a church in East France by Islamic extreme. Where is our hope in such a polarized and deeply hurting world found? I was reminded of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King who said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? In a similar posing, Richard Rohr, just this morning, considers his relocation away from worrying about his own personal salvation and a shift in focus outwards to what it means to be the body of Christ. To look outward and ask the question of how can I be good for the sake of my neighborhood, my community, my church, and my world. Jesus gives us the Beatitudes today, I think, to help us figure out the answer to these good questions. In the United Church in Canada, coming out of the Reformed tradition, we do not canonize saints. We believe in a ministry of service, inclusive of all abilities, gender expressions, and sexual orientation. There are no barriers, lay and ordered, young and old, assured and questioned, all make up our community. I recall a conversation I shared with Bob McCrubrey the other day, and he said his mom's model for life was that we should work to accept one another's beliefs and just get along. Our saints are folks we encounter on a daily basis, going the extra mile, seeing the journey through to the end. Could it be that those that we admire and miss are ones who understood that there are two sides to Jesus' beatitude way of living? Our grief is met at the door with compassion and the casserole. We watch from our screens the victims of injustice and raise our voices in a call for overturning of the established way power is held. We strive to live with respect in creation and be stewards of our environment in order to have it and to sustain it and pass on for future generations coming after us. Today, as we observe All Saints Day, we are going to take some time to remember those who have inspired us as individuals in the life of our community here at Winfield United Church and have left their marks on our hearts. When COVID arrived and saw us move out of the building and on to, into online services, we didn't really have the first thing figured out about how to bury our dead or extend comfort and sympathy to those we would have normally experienced in-person contact with. But today, we are living into that reality that is going to be our way of being for some time to come. So let us join together this morning 
Let's read the number. Joan Taylor, Ken Fitz, Pat McCoubrey, three individuals who were in active presence in this congregation. Elaine Tugut remembers, has these memories to share of Joan Taylor, who died March 13th. Joan Taylor has a long history with the United Church, involved as a youth in CGIT and Naramata sessions, and later in life working at the General Council office in Toronto as part of the Division of Mission Missions team. When she and Jim moved to Okanagan Center, Joan became a very active member of our church community. She became part of the worship ministry team, chairing it for a number of years, not only offering ideas and opinions, but taking an active role in making things happen. Years of accumulated church documents were in need of sorting and organizing, and Joan efficiently put the archives in order. Perhaps Joan's most memorable legacy will be the works of art she created in the form of beautiful banners and handmade prayer shawls. Thank you, Joan. Now we remember Ken Fitz, who died April 19th. And I share these words of memory on behalf of May Huss. Ken was a member of the United Church since early childhood, beginning in Penticton, BC, and then St. Paul's United in Kelowna, and ending in Winfield United Church. He was always a pillar in the congregation, holding a position of need and value. Ken never stepped back from taking on a role of responsibility, organizing and working with various groups in the church. Ken was a key organizer also in organizing the men's group. We can be thankful to Ken for having this building. He was instrumental in dealing with committees and working with the contractor until completion, seeing that we were able to gather here for our services and our functions. Ken was also a very capable photographer and was always submitting pictures of functions within the church and celebrations of members. Most of our historical photos are attributed to Ken. Ken was always there to lend an ear and join in conversation when he felt necessary. If you need a definition for the word friend, it could simply be Ken Dix. We miss him amongst us and his mischievous smile around us. Most recently, Pat McCrubley died on October the 11th. And I share some memories from Penny Gamble. When I was a little girl here in Winfield, Pat taught Sunday school and led the CGIT for many years. A few years ago, she reminisced with me about how much she loved working with the girls in CGIT, especially since she had raised three sons. In our community, she worked for years as Dr. Dobson's receptionist, where she took a personal interest in everyone. She lost her husband, John, who had a fatal heart attack in his mid-60s. She told me she missed him dearly, even many years later. She traveled to Japan in her 70s and shared her pictures, experiences, and perceptions of Japanese culture with the congregation in a special presentation. She was always willing to lend a hand and never sought the limelight. A gentle and loving lady. It was also shared with me this past week that yesterday marked the 16th anniversary of your first service in this building. Pat, 
Joan and Ken were all instrumental in making that service a reality and enjoying what we have. As Pat and Ken, uh, Pat and Joan were members of the trustees who helped organize the mortgages and the transfer of titles and all of those legal documents. And Ken was also chair of the building committee. So we give thanks for the vision the, and the steadfast um, you know, effort and tireless work that they, that they did for us. And we are thankful for other lives this morning as well. And so, for Bev Rutherford, remembered by Gordon and his daughters, For Leslie McCrory, remembered by Anita. For Patricia Cottonholtz and Rob Giesbrack, remembered by Dave and Anne. For Ken and Sylvia Fisher, remembered by Melanie. For Hank and Mamie Faber, remembered by Greg. For Marilyn, Marilyn Pullum, remembered by Bill. For Donna Schaefer, remembered by Trudy. For Joan Prentice, remembered by Elaine. For Marilyn Reed and Don James, Remembered by Karen. For Anna and Alex Kilman. Remembered by Mary Mom. For Phyllis Clausen. Also remembered by Mary Mom. For Dorothy Rubles, remembered by Tom. Again, for Ken Phipps, remembered by John. For Josephine, Remembered by Tanya and Maguire. For Brian Bowman. Remembered by Madeline. And for Gary Mellon, remembered by Yvonne. And Keith Kessler, remembered by me. Let us pray. O light of Christ, we have witnessed lives well lived, 
and lives cut too short. We are left below this great cloud of witnesses to continue the struggle for justice and love in this world. Still, we lament that we've lost these partners. May their memories be a blessing and a light to our labor. Amen. Let us prepare ourselves for the sherry and holy communion with the singing of We Are One. And as we sing that hymn, Jeanette and I will be passing up the communion elements. <clears throat> Jesus' memory surrounding us, we are welcomed at this table once again, Holy One. We remember with thanksgiving today the lives of those whom we have shared this life with, those we have worked alongside for the well-being of this community. With too many times to count, 
our everyday saints gathered around this table to strengthen their own spiritual journeys so that they might be companions to others who walked, walked along this road. And so today we share this meal with our collective memory, thankful for the lives of Joan, Ken, and Pat, and all those saints who have touched our lives in meaningful ways, and we have lighted candles for in their memories which burn brightly before us. We recollect so many other times of fellowship shared in the past of this community, Christmas bazaars, men's breakfasts, eat play love events, and the laughter and joy of young and old. We know we are not perfect loving God, and we're sorry for things said and done that have caused hurt and disappointment. Jesus reminds us through all times and circumstances that we are blessed and are blessing people. As we go this path, we remember those in our midst in need of our support and our care this day. We pray for Peter, for Lynn and Dawn, for Sharon, Jim, Catherine, and Stephen, for Lynn Roman, for Sandra, Roy, and Emily, for Shirley, for Kevin, for Dawn and Beth, for Sandy Hebert. And we gather all of these things, spoken and those things in our hearts, and pray the words that have most meaning for us in the silence of this space or simply reflect on all that has been shared. On the night before Jesus' death, he gathered with his friends in an upper room. In the spirit of communion and joining together, Jesus took bread from the table. He gave thanks to God, broke it, and passed it to his beloved, saying, This is the bread of new life. Every time you eat of it, remember me. And in the same manner, after the supper was over, Jesus lifted the cup, gave thanks, blessed it, and passed it to them, saying, This is the cup of blessing I long to give to you. When you drink of it, remember me. Abundant and gracious spirit, May we experience the fullness of your love for us in these ordinary elements of shared table. Even when we are not in one place, may we find this in this bread your fullness. May we find in this cup your joy. Fill our beings with your wonder as you bless this bread and cup. Bless our hearts with fullness. Amen. The red of light. Let us pray. Happy are we for the coming together to bless, to break, 
and to share our deepest longings for wholeness and restoration. May what we do here strengthen us for the task at hand, the loving of the world. Amen. So I am going to acknowledge that I failed to ask the folks at home their candles, um, saints. So I'm going to um, invite those folks who have the uh, saint to share with us, and I will light a, a candle in your in your stead. Please light a candle in memory of Alan and Marion Marchendale. Please, Please light, light a candle in memory of Bev Monroe. Please light a candle for Pierce Gamble and Remembered by Kenny. Please light a candle for Mick McGarry. Please light a candle for Doug Pollock. Please light a candle for Sean Faber. Please light a candle for Stuart and for Lorraine Thompson. Please light a candle for Stephen Taylor, my brother. Please light a candle for May Mackey. We light this last candle. Remembering all of those who go unnamed. Amen. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning in this service of remembering our saints. Our closing hymn, or well, it's kind of a hymn that's kind of a popular big band piece. I'm gonna, we're going to invite uh, Louis Armstrong into our space. And uh, you're both invited to stand as you are able as uh, we share in the saints. The saints come marching in. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's one you all can sing with us when the saints go marching in.
folks, everybody sing. Now when the saints go marching in, now when the saints go marching in, yes I want to be in that number. I win the saints go marching in. Sing it again. I win the saints marching in. I win the saints go marching in. Yes, I want to be in that number. I win the saints go marching in. Out there. Joe Spirit of God, already there. Amen. Amen. 